For the past few years, my wife and I have been breeding and selling Neocaridina shrimp, and it now makes up a sizable part of our income. In this video, I'm going to share with you how I would go about setting up a shrimp breeding business if I was starting today. Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Richard and I'm the author of the new ebook on Neocaridina shrimp. So if you want to start building a shrimp breeding business, where would you start? Well, before we start the video, let me begin with a caveat. Everything I share in this video is based on my experience and this is how I would do it. It doesn't mean it's the only way to do it, it doesn't even mean it's the best way to do it, but it is how I would go about doing it if I was starting again today. As a second point, even though I live in the UK, in this video I'm going to refer to everything in dollars. And I th the main reason being dollars is probably the closest thing we have to a worldwide currency. Most people, wherever they live in the world, will know what their own currency is worth against the dollar, whereas they may not against the British pound. So I'll refer to dollars, although here in the UK we do sell everything in pounds and pence. Let's start by looking at the setup you would want. In my experience, the simpler we keep the setup, the better. Personally, I choose to use the 6.5 gallon or 25 litre tubs. Here in the UK, glass aquariums are relatively expensive. An equivalent size glass aquarium to these tubs would set me back about $40. These I purchased for $15 a piece from Amazon. Would it be better if I had 10 gallon glass aquariums? Possibly yes. Would I breed and sell more shrimp? No, I doubt I would. And I would spend another three or $400 just setting up this rack alone. At the end of the day, these are not display tanks, they're shrimp breeding tanks. If you have access to cheap 10 gallon aquariums, then by all means use those. If like me, it's cheaper to buy plastic tubs, just buy plastic tubs, the shrimp won't care. So with the tank itself sorted, let's talk about heating, lighting and filtration. Beginning with the heating. Now, I don't heat any of these tanks behind me. They are just left to be at ambient room temperature, which means they're warmer in the summer and cooler in the winter. In the winter, they typically run at around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 20 degrees Celsius. And in the summer, they tend to be warmer. They tend to run at 74 degrees, give or take, which is about 23, 23 and a half degrees centigrade. So does this mean that they breed more during the summer than they do during the winter? Sure, it does. But I find in my experience that giving the females that rest of two or three months where they're not producing anywhere near as many babies, seems to improve their breeding rate over the summer. Plus during the winter, I'm not shipping any shrimp out anyway. We don't post out shrimp here in the UK in December, January or February because it tends to be too cold. So whilst shrimp kept in a heated aquarium at somewhere between 74 and 78 degrees Fahrenheit will breed more, they will produce more shrimp. In my experience, over the course of the year, giving them a chance to breed more and breed less does tend to give you a better, healthier colony overall. As for filtering, the bio load in these small aquariums tends to be minimal. There are no fish in these tanks, it is only shrimp. And so I found there is no need to filter these tanks at all. I have made videos in the past that saying that you should filter your shrimp tanks. And I think that comes down to a level of experience. And if you're new to fish keeping or the nitrogen cycle, more specifically within a fish tank, then you should definitely get a filter. It will make your life much easier. But once you're experienced and you understand how to keep the water parameters stable without a filter, there's no need to filter the tanks at all. I don't run filters in any of these. All I run in these tanks is a simple air stone, which provides surface agitation, giving me good oxygen exchange, keeping the water full of oxygen for the shrimp. And it gives me circulation, meaning I don't get any dead spots in the water. I don't get any stratification of the water. The air stone keeps the water moving like a filter would, but I don't actually run individual filters in any of these tanks. I do, however, think it is important to carry out water changes. I do carry out anywhere between 10 and 25% water changes once a week in each of these tanks. Those water changes help me keep the nitrates under control and lower the nitrate levels in the tanks, keeping the water safe and sweet for the shrimp to live in. As far as lighting goes, in each of these tanks here, I just run a pair of LED light bulbs suspended above rows of three tanks. Um, these aren't display tanks. We're not trying to show off the shrimp. We're not trying to make a tank look as good as possible. All I want the bulb to do is to provide a day and night cycle for the shrimp and also provide sufficient light for the Java moss to grow. 
I keep Java moss in each of these tanks, but I'll come back to more on that shortly. So in my shrimp breeding tanks, I don't run a filter, I just run an air stone. I don't run a heater, I just allow them to be at ambient temperature, which does mean shrimp production is higher in the summer, in the warmer months, and less so in the cooler months, but in my experience, that's okay. And I use basic lighting. There is nothing fancy about these setups. The important thing to remember is we're not creating display tanks, we're creating breeding tanks. These are purely places for the shrimp to breed. So with heating, lighting and filtration sorted, let's talk about what else I would keep in a shrimp breeding tank if I was setting up a shrimp breeding business. Now, I try and keep these tanks as sparse as possible. First of all, every tank has a layer of gravel. Now, it's just regular, cheap aquarium gravel. It's nothing special at all. I do appreciate there are lots of fantastic substrates available. But again, this isn't a display tank. This is just something to have on the bottom of the tank. Now, I could run bare bottom tanks, but I find having gravel provides an almost infinite number of places for bacteria to grow. And that bacteria is helping process any waste from the shrimp or from uneaten food that we put in the tank. In my experience, I get far better results having a gravel substrate than having no substrate at all. When I did run bare bottom tanks, I didn't find the shrimp bread nearly as much as they do in these tanks here. Now, as mentioned previously, I also keep a clump of Java moss in each of these tanks. And the reason I choose Java moss is one, it grows it's incredibly easy to grow. It barely needs any light at all and it will grow. I find having the Java moss in the tanks means the shrimp seem to be more relaxed. They seem to be more at ease because they have some cover. And I found that shrimp do breed better in tanks with Java moss than without it. The Java moss is also a fantastic place for biofilm to develop. And many shrimp will spend hour upon hour just combing the moss, looking for anything they can eat, biofilm, bacteria, bits of uneaten food. It really does seem to make a difference to them. And the final reason I add Java moss, if truth be told, is it's something else I can sell. We sell fairly small clumps of Java moss for about $5 a time. And it is essentially money for nothing. The moss is growing anyway. When we sell a portion of Java moss, we just bag it up, put an envelope, send it off. It's fabulous. It's, it adds additional income to the, the shrimp breeding project. Now, the final thing I add to each of my breeding tanks is one or two catapa leaves. Catapa leaves break down slowly in an aquarium. They're broken down by bacteria and the shrimp feed on that bacteria. Although they appear to be feeding on the leaves themselves, they're in fact feeding on the biofilm or the bacteria that's breaking these leaves down. By adding the catapa leaves, I find we have more, essentially more food for the shrimp to eat. It seems to be particularly popular with baby shrimp. And again, I have found over the years that aquariums with catapa leaves produce more shrimp than those without. It doesn't have to be catapa leaves. You can use oak leaves, maple leaves, beech leaves. The list goes on. I recently ran a survey on this channel of leaves people had to their aquariums and the range was phenomenal. It really surprised even me, to be fair. So that's the breeding setup itself covered. Essentially, simpler the better. You're trying to create an environment for the shrimp rather than a tank for you as the shrimp keeper to enjoy. If you have access to glass aquariums, fabulous. If not, plastic tubs, black bins, it doesn't matter what you use, as long as the shrimp are safe and have an environment they can grow and breed them. So with the breeding tank set up, let's look at the shrimp themselves next. I only breed and sell red cherry shrimp, yellow cherry shrimp and some blues. I don't tend to get bogged down in the more exotic varieties and I'll tell you why. First of all, in my experience, Whenever you sell a live aquatic creature, whether that's a shrimp, a snail, or a fish, it does not matter how good your starting stock is, how well you keep those creatures, or indeed how well you ship them to the buyer, all that matters is how likely they are to survive once they reach the buyer's house. When you send shrimp through the boat to a buyer, that buyer could have the worst setup possible. It doesn't matter how much information you provide them, it doesn't matter how much you tell them they should set their temperature, their pH, the water parameters, etc. No matter how their tank is set up, if your shrimp don't survive for the first two or three days after they add them to the tank, it will be your fault. Now, what that means to us as shrimp breeders and sellers is we need to be selling and shipping the hardiest shrimp we possibly can to give them the best chance of survival when they get to the other side. 
Countless times in the past, we have sold shrimp to people, we have shipped them out in tip-top condition. They've arrived, the buyer has added them to their tank, 24, 40 hours later, they're complaining our shrimp are poor quality and we sell rubbish shrimp and they should get a refund. And yet every other shrimp in the tank is doing absolutely fine. And I don't believe it's the shipping process. We have honed our shipping process, which I'll come back to shortly. We have honed that down to the best system we can possibly develop. And when we ship shrimp to good homes, they almost, have an almost perfect survival rate. We have learned the hard way. You are best to sell and ship only the hardiest shrimp you can. And in my experience, that's red cherry shrimp, yellow shrimp, and the blue shrimp. Unfortunately, as a seller, it will always be your fault when the shrimp die. No matter how much information you give the buyers, they will still complain. You can give yourself the best chance by not selling the more delicate varieties. Are there shrimp that are much cooler than red cherry shrimp? Of course there are. Red cherry shrimp are your bulk standard shrimp. But believe me, when it comes to selling and shipping shrimp, the hardier the better. Now my next reason for selling just the reds, the yellows or the blue cherry shrimp is because they're cheap. I sell each of my red cherry shrimp for about $1, $1.50 a piece, which means a group of 10 red cherry shrimp will set the buyer back somewhere between $10 and $15. Now to look at another example, if I was to sell five orange eye red tiger shrimp, I might sell those for $70 or $80 for the five. Now while on the face of it, that might seem that the orange eye blue tigers are a better bet because I get more money, the reality is I won't sell nearly as many. We can easily sell 50 or 60 red cherry shrimp a day whereas we might sell five orange eye blue tigers once a month, twice a month. The money from the red cherry shrimp comes in day after day after day whereas with the more exotic species the, the buyers tend to be fewer and further between. And on a similar note, red cherry shrimp have mass appeal. There are newcomers to our hobby every single day and those newcomers are far more likely to buy 10 red cherry shrimp at $15 than they are to buy five orange eye blue tigers or five Taiwan bees or whatever it might be, which means the number of buyers we've got to choose from is far larger. It's a much larger pool than the pool that want the more exotic, more expensive shrimp. So we give ourselves the best chance of making a sale by choosing to breed the shrimp that most people are looking to buy. To give you some idea, here in the UK, we will sell anywhere between 600 and 1,000 red cherry shrimp in one month. We might sell three or 400 yellow shrimp in the same month, and we'll perhaps sell 150 to 300 of the blue shrimp. The reality is, I only breed these shrimp to sell. So it's in my interest, and will be in your interest, to breed and sell the shrimp that are in the highest demand. In my experience, there is far more money to be made selling bulk standard red cherry shrimp than there is selling the more exotic varieties. Now, another point I should mention here is, whenever I sell my shrimp, no matter how good those shrimp are, I just sell them as red cherry shrimp. I will never advertise them as fire reds or painted fire reds or Bloody Marys. Grading shrimp can often be subjective. It can be a matter of opinion. Something I think might be a fire red, you might think is a painted fire red. The next person might say, well, that's a Bloody Mary. Whatever it might be, it becomes incredibly subjective. We found in the past that we've sent out high grade shrimp and we've called them X. And when the buyers received them, they've held the bag up and said, these aren't X, these are Y. You've conned me, I want my money back, I want a refund. Because we are working on selling in high numbers, we have found it is better to sell as bog standard red cherry shrimp, then send out high quality shrimp, and the buyers are chuffed to bits. They are super pleased. They were expecting bog standard red shrimp, and they've got these fabulous bright red shrimp. They're chuffed to bits every single time. Essentially, you're, you're under promising and over delivering every time. And in my experience, that's how you keep the customer happy and you keep them coming back for more shrimp. We have no end of feedback where people are saying how fantastically impressed they were with the color of the shrimp we supplied them. And that's what you want at the end of the day, happy customers. Of course, ultimately, which shrimp you would breed and you would sell is very much a matter of personal choice. You may well decide you want to specialize in the more exotic varieties of shrimp, and that's all very well. It is personal choice. This is just how I've done it, and this is how I've made a business which generates a decent side income. So, so far we've covered how we would go about setting up an aquarium and 
how we would then heat, light, and filter that aquarium, and which shrimp I would choose to sell. I think what I'll do is I'll break this down into two parts, and in the next episode, I will talk about how I go about feeding the shrimp, how I go about selling those shrimp, and the way I found is best to package those shrimp to guarantee they arrive safely. We offer a 100% live arrival guarantee, and we managed to do that because we've developed a system that pretty much works 99.9% .9 of the time. We've had shrimp go missing in the British Postal System for days and days and days, and the buyer eventually received them and reported they were 100% survival rate. They were all absolutely fine, but we packaged them in case they are delayed for several days. And the system seems to work. So I'll share that with you all as well. Now, if you're watching this video a week or more in the future, I'll pop a link to the second episode just up here on screen. If not, do subscribe to the channel, then as soon as the next episode is released, you won't miss out. Thanks for watching.